Can God make a dog that's too big for him to walk? That's our question for today. Historically, this question has been known as the omnipotence paradox, or the paradox of the stone. And as it has been historically fleshed out, the question goes, can God make a stone that's too big for him to lift? But you guys are obsessed with dogs. As Americans, we got dog mamas, we got dog fur babies. Uh, I saw a car the other day that said, I heart my grand dog. Like, this lady was proud of her child's dog. So you guys are obsessed with dogs, so I've chose, I've chosen to use dogs uh, instead of stones. So I want to talk about greater Swiss mountain dogs, because if God were to create a dog that's too big for him to walk, it would have to be a greater Swiss mountain dog. So let's talk about Maverick, my mom's friend's dog. He's a beast. Maverick is a greater Swiss mountain dog and seriously an absolute brute. He's a really sweet boy and would never intentionally hurt anyone. But watching him pulverize and scarf down a half chicken engenders a, a little bit of fear. You know, he's not aggressive in the slightest. He's actually extremely uh, loving, but he's just really excitable and exceptionally powerful, both of which make him a formidable foe on walks. Swissies like Maverick were bred for all around farm purposes, like herding and pulling heavy milk carts. So they have agility and power. <clears throat> in fact, Swissies even compete in an event called, creatively titled, weight pulling, where they pull massive amounts of weight. And apparently they pulled this weight for 15 feet. And the record right now is 5,136 pounds, which is insane. So if God were if God were able to create a dog that's too big for him to walk, it would have to be a Swiss mountain dog. <clears throat> so can he do that? What do, you, what do we think? This, this is a paradox because if God were able to create a dog that's too big for him to walk, then he wouldn't be omnipotent because he wouldn't be able to walk a certain dog out there, a created dog. But if God were unable to make this dog, well, what? He's not powerful enough to make the dog? So either way, it seems that we have a problem for God's omnipotence, God's omnipotence, God's all-powerfulness. It seems that there's there's a limit on God's omnipotence either way we look at it. So I want to go over three different answers that philosophers through philosophers and theologians throughout time have given. One's a univocal answer, one's an equivocal answer, and one's an analogical answer. Those three words uh, have to do with language. Univocal uh, etymologically means univocal with one voice. Uh, equivocal has to do, um, the fallacy of equivocation is when you use a word with two different meanings. <clears throat> and so uh, an analogical answer, an analogy. An analogy is used in teaching um, to compare two things that aren't exactly the same, but have enough continuity uh, where using one thing as an analogy of another helps bring greater clarity. And so these uh, terms are going to make more sense as we get into our answers here. So let's start with a univocal answer. So this paradox, this Swissy paradox of a gigantic clifford size Swiss mountain dog, <clears throat> while it may be a new scenario for us, it certainly isn't anything new in and of itself. In fact, Catholic theologian Thomas Aquinas addressed this issue back in the mid-13th century. Thomas answered this problem first by distinguishing between what's physically possible and what's logically possible. For mankind, there are logical impossibilities like drawing a square circle, and there are also physical impossibilities like running a one-minute mile. Running a one-minute mile isn't logically impossible because it isn't a contradiction. That's what it means to be a logical impossibility. Like a, a square circle is logically impossible, but running a one-minute one minute mile isn't. It's just not physically possible yet, but no one's done it. Um, I guess, yeah, if you're talking about transhumanism, you you had souped up legs or something, then it would move from a physical impossibility to a possibility. And so you see, it's not a logical impossibility. And these, this two, these two uh, different types of possibilities are big for Aquinas. Aquinas says, for God, all physical possibilities are possible. It's only the logical impossibilities that are impossible for God. And so this is a univocal answer 
in that Aquinas is saying what's impossible logically for us is also logically impossible for God, but what's physically impossible for us is not physically impossible for God. God could create a body for himself. He could come incarnate that body again like he did in Jesus Christ, but he could incarnate the body of some super human being who could run a one minute mile. Boom. So it's not physically impossible, but Aquinas is saying that even God can't draw a square circle. Aquinas says, now nothing is opposed to the notion of being except a not non-being. Therefore, that which implies being and non-being at the same time is incompatible with the notion of an absolutely possible thing within the scope of divine omnipotence. For such cannot come under the divine omnipotence, not because of any defect in the power of God, but because it is not the nature of a feasible or possible thing. Therefore, everything that does not imply a contradiction is numbered among those possible things, in respect of which God is called omnipotent. But whatever implies a contradiction does not come within the scope of divine omnipotence, because it cannot have the aspect of possibility. Hence, it is better to say that such things cannot be done than that God cannot do them. So Aquinas, again, he's, he's fleshing out his distinction between logical and physical impossibilities. But then at the end, he says, we, sh we ought not say that God cannot do this. We should just say that it, it can't be done. For which it follows that God can't do it, though. Like, we can still say that on Aquinas' account. He's, maybe he's just making a pious point that it's, it's not very pious to say that God can't do something. He's saying it's not a limitation for God because really no one can do it. You can't even think of it. It's a logical impossibility. There's no problem, so he can't do that. Oh, well, creating a dog too big for him to walk is a logical impossibility. And so it's no big deal to say that God can't do it. So then for Aquinas, it's no slight to God's omnipotence that he can't cre create a square circle because it's logically absurd. And, and applying to our giant Swiss mountain dog, Swiss mountain um Swiss mountain dog analogy, it's it's no problem. It's, it's, it can't be done for us, can't be done for God. That's that. So that's our univocal answer. But not everyone has been comforted by Aquinas' answer, namely Rene Descartes. And here I'm pulling from Ronald Nash's account of Rene Descartes. And Na Nash says, Rene Descartes and a few other philosophers have rejected the view that God's power is limited by the law of non-contradiction. Descartes believed an omnipotent being could do absolutely anything, including that which is self-contradictory. God's actions are not limited by the laws of logic. So the laws of logic, um, the law of identity, the law of excluded middle, and the law of non-contradiction apply everywhere universally. A thing is a thing. That's the law of identity. A thing is not uh, both a thing and non-thing in the same way, in the same manner. Uh, that's the law of non-contradiction. And either a thing is or it isn't, but it's not somewhere between being and non-being. That's the law of excluded middle. And so Aquinas is a, it seems like Aquinas is saying that God and us both equally stand underneath the law of non-contradiction. God can't do logical impossibilities and we can't do logical impossibilities. Now there's a problem for people like Rene Descartes and uh, and Occam of the famous Occam's razor, who were more nominalistic and volunteeristic. Volunteer, volunteerism is a philosophy that says exactly what Nash just said, that God can do lo the, logical, the logically impossible because he's all powerful. And so these guys want to emphasize God's power over against God's mm, limitations by logic. So Nash goes on to say, Descartes advanced this view on the conviction, apparently, that the Thomist, that the Thomist position dishonors God by making him subject to a law, the law of non-contradiction, that Descartes believed is as dependent on God's will as any other law. Just as God could have created the world so that it was governed by different laws of nature, so also he could have subjected the world to different logical and mathematical laws. According to Descartes, God freely decreed the logical and mathemat mathematical truths that obtain in our world and could have created a different world in which the principle of non-contradiction or propositions like 2 plus 2 equals 4 were necessarily false. So this is, this is the philosophy of volunteerism. 
the laws of logic, which seem to us to be so logically binding that there's no possible world where we can imagine a square circle, that truth was just invented by God. God doesn't have to obey it. He created it for this universe. Now, there, there's differences uh, even amongst volunteerists. Some volunteers say that God could make a square circle today, right now. Doesn't matter what happened in the past. God can do whatever. He's free to do whatever he wants, whenever he wants. Other volunteerists say God could have made square circles a real possibility in this universe before he created it. But since he created this universe with the logical laws and the physical laws for which he created it, he can't go back on his word, so God can't contradict himself, and therefore God cannot create square circles today, or in our scenario, giant uh, Swiss mountain dogs that he himself couldn't walk, because he's already established the rules. And so there's even some some uh, dialogues and, and disagreements within volunteerism itself. So some of you guys are thinking, you know, that sounds pretty crazy. Like God can just do all sorts of irrational stuff. Well, the reason that we don't just laugh off Descartes is that he wasn't some raving irrationalist. In fact, he's known as one of the most prominent rationalists of the entire history of philosophy. Descartes was concerned to honor God's power as creator. He was seeking to avoid infusing our idea of God with man's logic. Descartes was trying to stave off what he saw as idolatry. So for him, the law of non-contradiction must be sacrificed in order to allow God to be truly omnipotent and free. But the implications of Descartes' move are too grave for those who want to affirm any knowledge of God. For instance, if God can act contrary to the laws of logic, then God could be irrational and he couldn't be held to his revealed words in the Bible. God could be both good and evil simultaneously. He could be omnipotent and impotent at the same time and in the same manner. And if everything follows from a contradiction, which philosophers claim, then you know what kind of chaos would follow from an omnipotent God that could contradict himself? So that's the equivocal answer, uh, that, that the laws of logic are equivocal between us and God. For us, they're, they're logically binding. For God, they're not logically binding. Recall back to the univocal answer. That is that the laws of logic are univocal for both us and for God. They, they're binding on us equally as they are on God. So we have univocal, we have equivocal, and now we're going to go over an analogical answer. And this is the one that I hold to myself. So while we might vehemently disagree with Descartes' move, some of us might still sympathize with, well, you know, his, his sympathies. We may want to avoid smuggling our created logic back into the mind of God while still acknowledging God's self-consistency. Enter Cornelius Van Til. In a similar vein as Descartes, Van Til argues that the law of non-contradiction shouldn't be thought of as some abstract, abstract principle that judges both God and man on the same level. For Van Til, the laws of logic are necessary and true for created reality, but they aren't univocal with God's thought. Rather, they are analogical to God's thought. Van Til says that God existed as the self-conscious and self-consistent being. The law of non-contradiction, therefore, as we know it, is but the expression on a created level of the internal coherence of God's nature. So an analogical view of the law of non-contradiction sees it as a created reality, just like Descartes sought to, on, sought to honor, yet as analogous to God's very own self-consistent nature, contra Descartes' irrationalistic view. This means that mankind can know God through God's revelation of himself, as well as the addition of good and necessary consequent, like using logic, rather than setting up the laws of logic on their own as an ultimate criterion for both God and man. Van Til allows us to affirm God's self-consistency, his logical nature, and the necessity of the laws of logic for human thought. But an analogical view of logic also leaves room for the mysteries of God that might be warranted paradoxes for us, like the Trinity, divine determinism and free will, and the Incarnation. These paradoxes, which are fully understood by God, are apparently contradictory 
for us. Well, because our thoughts are analogically related to God's, we can know truly, but not fully. There are some things that our human logic hasn't been able to crack yet, and others that we may never be able to crack. Now, this makes sense given the doctrine of incomprehensibility of God and the creator-creature distinction. And so this analogical answer that Van Til gives, he wants to affirm the good of both Descartes and the voluntarists and Thomas Aquinas and the Thomists, the more rationalists uh, approach where we find the law of logic holding for both God and man. None of us want to say that God can do the irrational, except maybe Descartes. But he was doing that because he's trying to uphold God's freedom. But, you know, like Descartes, we don't want to say that there's this, this third thing. There's this Platonic realm where the non-contradiction, where the law of non-contradiction lives in which God has to look at every time he wants to create or do an action. Because otherwise, you know, this higher standard above God, that would be God. Why don't we worship the law of non-contradiction instead of God? Van Til's answer is, God's own nature, he is self-consistent with himself. God cannot tell a lie. God cannot go against his own logical nature. God is good. He can't do evil. There's a lot of things that God can and can't do, but he can and can't do certain things based on his own good nature. He can't tell a lie because he's good and lying is bad. So an analogical answer is this happy medium between the two, where we can say that the law of non-contradiction is a created reality. Does that mean God could have created the law of non-contradiction differently, where it allows square circles? I don't think so, because I think the law of non-contradiction coheres with God's internally consistent nature. And so if you want to think of the law of non-contradiction as a proposition about propositions, which it, I think it is, uh, a proposition is the the content of a, of a sentence so if, if a sentence has propositional content, that means that there's a proposition in there that's being expressed by the sentence. And you can express that same proposition differently in different languages or you know, switching the words around. As long as you're still maintaining the same content, you have the same proposition. So the law of non-contradiction is a proposition about propositions. It's a proposition stating that all other propositions have to be uh, either true or false, but not both truth and, and false in the same way, in the same manner, in the same time. So this proposition is a created reality that reflects God's internal consistency. So therefore, the, the truth bearer, which is the proposition, the truth bearer can exist in God's mind. We need, to, we need a place for it. Where do we put this law of non-contradiction? Where is it? You can't go to Trader Joe's and buy the proposition which expresses the law of non-contradiction. Where is it? Well, theists want to say that it's in the mind of God. God has eternally thought this way. Well, why is he thought this way? Well, because that represents his very own nature. So his self-consistent nature is the truth maker, the thing that makes the proposition true for the truth bearer, which is the proposition that A is A and not both non-A and A at the same time. Okay, I know that's a lot. I know it's getting kind of crazy. But an analogical answer, I think, is our best bet. Because that way we can still uphold the law of non-contradiction and we can still uphold that God can't be irrational. But it's not because God is beholden to some other thing. He's beholden to himself. And he's not irrational because his nature won't allow him to be. God is good while still saying that the law of non-contradiction is binding everywhere, even though it's a created reality. When God chose to create, he created by this principle of non-contradiction, which coheres with and corresponds to his very own nature. So lest the reader think that uh, Van Til's approach ultimately ends up in the same place as Descartes, we can be assured that the two are completely different. Whereas Descartes sought to bolster God's power by isolating his will and leaving it free from all constraints, Van Til says, God's power should not be identified with his will. Although God's will implies power to accomplish what he wills, God's omnipotence does not signify that he can make a lie true. 
that he can sin. There is no absolute power in God that works in contradiction to his perfections. God is the source of possibility. What is possible is determined by God's nature. The very question whether God can do the impossible itself is impossible. It has no meaning unless it is first assumed that there is such a thing as impossibility apart from God. Now, if there is such an impossibility, God is not God. So the question drops. On the other hand, if there is no such impossibility, that is, if God is the source of possibility, the question is answered before it is put, i.e., then God does not want to break an impossibility. He would be denying himself, which he tells us he cannot do. So ultimately, we as Christians look to God's revelation for an answer to this question, not merely an abstract view of logic. It is God's very own nature that defines what is possible and what is impossible. God tells us that he will not and cannot contradict himself. And it is on this basis that we use our logic to figure out how God's self-disclosure applies to whether he can or cannot make a dog that's too big for him to walk. So now let's begin untying this, this Swissy paradox that we've uh, set up. Based on God's revelation and the laws of logic, we can agree with Aquinas that God cannot make a square circle and other such irrationalities like a stone that's all blue and all red all over. Though we do not agree with him, with Aquinas, on abstract principles of logic and possibility without reference to the nature of God. However, when we examine the paradox of the giant Swissy again, it's not immediately clear that this is a logical contradiction in the same way that a square circle is. After all, a square circle is meaningless. I can't think of a person of person X making a, a square circle, but I can think of person X making a big robot dog that's far too powerful for person X to walk. So how do we answer our problem of God making a dog that's too big for him to walk? Concerning the puzzle of a square circle and puzzles like our Swissy paradox, George Mavrode says, despite this apparent difference, the second puzzle is open to essentially the same answer as the first. The dilemma fails because it consists of asking whether God can do a self-contradictory thing. And the reply that he cannot does not damage the doctrine of omnipotence. So why does Mavrodes think that the Swissy paradox is open to the same refutation as the square circle? Mavrodes argues that when you start the puzzle, you must either assume that God is omnipotent or that he isn't. If you start the puzzle by assuming that God is not omnipotent, well, then who cares? You've ended up right where you started. You think he isn't, and I think he is. The force of the argument is only felt if we start with the assumption that God is omnipotent, and then you show that this assumption leads to a reductio ad absurdum, a reduction to absurdity. But if we start with the assumption that God is omnipotent, then the phrase a dog too big for walk become a dog too big for God to walk becomes immediately self-contradictory for God. So we have to change this phrase into a phrase that says, a dog too big for him whose power is sufficient for walking any dog. Thus, the question can be answered, no, God cannot create a dog that is too big for him to walk because that would be self-contradictory for God. And it is God's nature that he cannot contradict himself. Okay, so maybe that sounds like, you know, we're playing around with words a little bit too much. If, if you start the process by saying, you know, look, I'm just assuming that God's not omnipotent. Okay, well, dude, that's just your assumption. You're just stating that. I'm assuming that he is. So how are we going to get past this? In order for you to show me, for you who doesn't believe that God's omnipotent, in order for you to prove to me who does believe he's omnipotent, you got to take on my understanding first and show how my understanding reduces down to an absurdity in philosophy that's called a reductio ad absurdum. So we both have to start on the assumption God is omnipotent, and then your goal is to show a contradiction in that belief so that I can't hold it any longer. But for you to come out, you know, guns blazing, saying that I'm already wrong without demonstrating it is silly. I don't have to listen to that. But once we start with the proposition that God is omnipotent, then we need to redefine some stuff. So if God's omnipotent, then omnipotent, all-powerful, this God has the power to walk any dog. And so if you're asking God who has sufficient power to walk any dog to make a dog that's too big for him to walk, that is self-contradictory for that kind of God. So in denying God's ability to create a dog that's too big for him to walk, 
We're not weakening the, doc, weakening the doctrine of omnipotence. We're upholding it. God is too powerful to perform self-contradictory tasks. In summarizing his critique of such tasks, Mavrode says, they fail because they propose as tests of God's power putative tasks whose descriptions are self-contradictory. Such pseudo-tasks, not falling within the realm of possibility, are not objects of power at all. Hence, the fact that they cannot be performed implies no limit on the power of God, and hence, no defect in the doctrine of omnipotence. Now, in a, in a similar fashion, John Frame says, For God is omnipotent, and however we choose to define omnipotence, it certainly entails that he can lift any stone, or walk any dog for us, of any weight. So the preventer here is his infinity, together with his logical nature or his power itself. These are all, of course, strengths rather than weaknesses. And then lastly, finishing up with Herman Bovink, who is quoting from Augustine, he says, God cannot will anything and everything. He cannot deny himself. Since he does not will it, he cannot do it, because he is unable even to will it. For justice cannot will what is unjust, nor wisdom what is foolish, or truth what is false. Whence we are reminded that the omnipotent God not only cannot deny himself, as the Apostle says, but that there are many things he cannot do. The omnipotent God cannot die. He cannot be changed. He cannot be deceived. He cannot be created. He cannot be overcome. Augustine further asserts that this is not a lack of power, but on the contrary, true absolute power. If God could err or sin, etc., that would indeed be a sign of powerlessness. So can God make a dog that's too big for him to walk? No. But doesn't that mean he's not omnipotent? On the contrary. It's because he is omnipotent that he can't perform such self-contradictory, nonsensical pseudo-tasks like creating a Swiss mountain dog that's too big for him to walk. Well, that does it for us today, guys. Thanks for tuning in. I hope you learned something. Hope you thought about something in a new way. And as always, all glory to God.